wonderful good noon, everybody. I won't say morning, I won't say afternoon. We're exactly at noon. Um, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for attending this joint uh, seminar sponsored by Hyper and the Epidemiology Department. I really appreciate you coming today. I do need a quick just housekeeping, let you know that um, there should be another seminar in September, but we don't have any information on that one yet. But we do have the next seminar that we know information on. It's going to be a joint Hyper um, Environmental Occupational Health Seminar on October 27th at noon, the room to be announced. And that's going to be on construction worker injuries. It'll be given by um, a relatively new faculty member, Natalie Schlotka. So put that on your calendar. But today, it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Zach Kerr. Zach is the director of the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association's Injury Surveillance Program. Uh, for those of you that know my work at the high school level, I modeled my high school Rio system after this NCAA system. So we have lots of opportunities to collaborate, and it's exciting that the two systems are so similar because we can directly compare rates and patterns of injury across the age continuum since the two surveillance systems use such similar definitions of injury and, and exposure. Uh, but Jack, uh, Jack, Zach, <laughs> I know him so well. Um, Zach actually started his public health career as a, a grassroots community outreach person in HIV prevention. He then picked up a master's degree in art, journalism, and communication at Ohio State University. Followed the, by Ohio State University. the Ohio State University. Followed by an, a master's of public health and epidemiology from Ohio State University. That's where I first met Zach. Uh, I had the honor of, of working with him while he was an MPH student. And for those of you students in the room, um, I think Zach knocked out four first author manuscripts in one semester working with me at OSU. So uh, he sets a high bar. Uh, he then went on to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he got a PhD. He has over 23 publications to his credit already, even though he just recently earned his PhD. And he was the inaugural winner of the American Public Health Association's Injury Control Environmental Health Services Section Student Presentation Award. Yeah, Student Presentation Award. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Zach. All right. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Okay. Let me make sure this mic is on. Can everyone hear me? It's not that loud, so ours. I'm not. Well, I'm a loud speaker, so. Um, just, yes, yeah, so it is being taped. So, um, I think it's working. Yeah, I can hear myself. All right. I need the little earpiece like Britney Spears or something. Um, <laughs> so just a quick show of hands just so I can get an idea. How many here are, are actually students? Oh, okay. Good majority. So yeah, I, I actually just got my uh, PhD here in December. I actually finished early to take this job and this is a great opportunity. I started working in injury epidemiology with Don Comstock uh, using the high school uh, reporting information online surveillance system. And it's just been a great opportunity to then go to UNC and then start working with the NCAA injury surveillance program and then to transition to this position where I'm actually directing it. And it's just been this, this wonderful opportunity. And so I hope um, when, we, uh, when I get to meet with the students, I can tell a little bit more about how my uh, career and my uh, plans have progressed over the past few years. I mean, it's kind of been a whirlwind because um, I remember thinking I, I would never get a PhD and here I am now. And it's still very surreal to hear the doctor in front of my name. Um, and I think as much as chagrin of my friends who get annoyed of me forcing them to call me doctor, it's just, um, you know, I've, I've earned it. I, I'm going to stick with it for six months, and um, then I'll go on my merry way just being called Zach or, you know, other words that I can't say right now. Um, so really, the focus of today's talk that I really wanted to focus on was really looking at this idea of what is an injury. It's something that we're all pretty aware of what it is, and we can see it and detect it, but in the research world, we have to operationalize it and conceptualize it. So I kind of wanted to talk through a history of how injury has previously been defined and how we at the Data Center for Sports Injury uh, Prevention Research define it. And I wanted to sort of lead that into describing what the injury surveillance program is uh, that we use for the NCAA and present you with some examples of the research we do. There we go. All right. So an injury is typically defined in the research world as three components. Um, and each of these get a little bit more controversial as we move forward. So requires medical attention. Not much controversy there. 
Uh, results from participation in a school sanctioned practice or competition. There's some issues about that because people ask about what about conditioning or what about uh, warm ups and how do we define that and when that's a practice and when that's a competition. And I think that's another discussion for another day because I think the third one here is really where it gets a little controversial. Uh, we usually define injury in the surveillance sense as missing at least 24 hours beyond the date of injury. So this means that we aren't really, unfortunately, not looking at non time loss injuries. Um, and I like to think of this uh, work in the realm of injury surveillance as sort of the seesaw in which we have on one end of the seesaw the researchers and academics, the ones who want to collect the injury research and they want to look at what sort of injury prevention tools they can create from this research. But then on the other side, we have the sports medical staff, the sports physicians, the uh, athletic trainers, the individuals who are actually collecting and providing us with the data. And the struggle is trying to find this balance as to what's going to provide enough research for the researchers and academics to be able to get useful information but not belabor the work of the sports medical staff who are already doing so much for their athletes, for their coaches, for their universities. So um, if we put all the weight on the side of the researchers and the academics, that would be sort of looking at exhaustively collecting all injury data, all risk factors, just getting a real comprehensive look at everything that's going on when an individual is injured or at least uh, exposed for uh, participation in sports. That really puts a lot on the plate for the sports medical staff. Uh, at times, in the historical sense, we were asking individuals to double enter data, so they would have to enter their data into electronic medical records, but then at the same time also entered into our paper and pencil forms, our computer digital, digital forms that we have nowadays. If we go on the other end and we only capture a subset of injury data, it really helps uh, minimize the amount of burden on the athletic trainers. But as a result, the researchers, the academics are screaming, where's the data? Uh, at times, we may have to look at uh, sub-studies or additional follow-up studies, which may be uh, more expensive or more costly or more time intensive for us as researchers. So really, we need to find that fine middle ground between what's going to be feasible for the sports medical staff but what's going to provide a great deal of information that's going to help uh, move forward the realm of sports injury uh, surveillance. So we have to find a way to really kind of uh, look for that fine middle ground. I'm going to go backwards here real quick. Sorry, forgive me. This is the first time I'm using this tool. Um, so one of these ways that they tried to look for this compromise in this balance was this evolution of this time loss injury. And this is a quote from 1976 during one of the first injury surveillance programs that was done called NARES, which was the National Athlete Injury Illness Reporting System, which was really one of the first injury studies looking at uh, the field of sports. And I want to read this quote out loud uh, from Clark, who is the author. Um, Institutions do not have medical record librarians to cover their sports offerings. Too much detail burdens the athletic trainer who must fill out the forms or supervises the process. Too little detail makes the effort useless or prompts a separate study for the needed information. Orthopedists and athletic trainers have been well represented in the pilot years and theirs, helping us pursue the goal of reasonable compromises on detail. So really, this has been an issue that has been going on for the last 35, 40 years. Uh, and one of the ways that the uh, academics decide upon a compromise is really looking at this historic definition of a time loss injury, which is restricting it to those that uh, caused individuals to lose at least 25 days or 25 hours, excuse me, beyond the day of injury. Uh, and in years past, uh, we've later added concussions, fractures, dental injuries, things that may have a return to place sooner than that to sort of capture some of those uh, more uh, severe injuries. And uh, we've had some examples of uh, this historic use of time loss injury from the 80s and 90s. John Powell was one of the first individuals to really look at these things. Uh, Don's uh, high school Rio system uses the time loss injury mentioned here. Um, the National Collegiate uh, Injury Surveillance System uh, was also using the uh, version of this definition up until 2009. And this is where the Daedalus Center came in. In 2009, we were granted the ability to house the old data uh, and start collecting the new data from the 2009-10 academic year. And we really wanted to think of a way to find uh, a manner to collect more in-depth information, but at the same time not um, maximize the burden on the athletic trainers. So we went with this uh, 
data collection method, which is really looking at time loss injuries and non-time loss injuries. So we're collecting all data regardless of time loss. And some examples of some of these uh, manuscripts that have been published uh, are presented here, and um, they're slowly kind of making their way into the, the research hemisphere, I guess you could say. Um, and the reason why we can do this is we use a sort of unique data collection method, which involves three components. Uh, the first one, the common data elements, the export engines, the second one, and the verification engines, the third one. And I'm going to go into these a little bit more in depth for each one. Um, but the main advantage that I want to really just uh, focus on up front is that there's no double data entering. The individuals who are participating in our studies, the athletic trainers who are providing us with their injury data for the teams they work with, um, only have to enter the data into their electronic medical records, and then we're able to get those uh, data de-identified uh, sent to our servers. Um, and electronic health record, electronic medical record, that's something I'm going to be saying a lot, EHR, EMR, um, and really I just wanted to define this up front before I start rambling off into uh, that world. Uh, these are really just used by ATs to detail and track the injuries sustained by the athletes. So if an injured athlete shows up uh, to their athletic training clinic, uh, they get treated, the athletic trainer puts it in a data set, sort of a spreadsheet or a um, sort of Microsoft-based or independently owned-based program that lets them keep track of when the injuries occurred, what the injuries were, what the treatment is, and uh, what the outcomes are associated with it. So this figure here is a very complex figure that sort of outlines the whole process of these uh, data collection methods. And I'm not going to put this up and say, well, I'll give you a few minutes to look at this. I'm going to try to go through each bit piece by piece to really help you understand what's going on in this really, really complex system. Um, when I first started the NCAA, uh, uh, injury surveillance program, I, it, it kind of blew me away how this is even possible, but it's not as complex as it looks. It's really just certain pieces. So the, the first step is that we work with certain vendors of these electronic medical records. Uh, ATS, SIMS are two of the, the popular ones that we work with, and we give them a code book based upon what we want information-wise. And they then um, apply these codes to their data sets so that they can adhere to the uh, injury surveillance program's uh, code book. So as I mentioned, we currently work with two electronic uh, health record vendors, ATS SIMS. We also have an in-house one that we provide free to the uh, NCAA member institutions in case they can't afford one. Um, we just want to make sure that's not a barrier to uh, their participation. With that said, however, we're, we kind of make it very bare bones so it's not a competitor to ATS or SIMS. So if they want more of the perks and the extras, they're able to by uh, those systems, or they can use a more bare-bones freeware version, which is IST. So, you know, to put this in plain English, let's say we have an athletic trainer working on ATS, an athletic trainer working on IST, and an athletic trainer working on SIMS. Uh, when the data is entered in into their code books or into their data systems, um, it may come in with ATS as numerical binary code. So this is um, just an example I'm kind of throwing on the air. ATS may or may not code their data this way, but I'm trying to show uh, examples here to, to help kind of illustrate how different codes are kind of merged into one uh, common data element. So IST will perhaps code it in as concussion, as a numeric or as a, a character variable. And then you have uh, SIMS, which may have it be another character variable, just a random set of uh, letters. What the common data elements does is that we're able to have a click of a button send all that data to our data list server as concussions. So it doesn't matter how it's coded on their end. When the data is transferred over to our system, it's all coded alike, no matter if it's from ATS, IST, or SIMS. So as mentioned, the data will be entered by the AT on their own system. Uh, and so that will then be sent to the data list center de-identified. So this is really, again, emphasizing the need to uh, not have double data entering. Um, the export engine will simply extract the required data we need without their name, their school, or not, I'm sorry, not their uh, school. We will have that school information, um, but they won't have their name or any other identifying information that may be in on the uh, system on their side. And if they ever do go back to change things, uh, we'll never know the name of the athlete. Are there uh, date of birth or anything like that? Um, to make sure that the, the 
common data elements are actually working, we go through a data check process in two steps. And the first step is actually called the verification engine. And this is an automatic data check to make sure that things are looking right in the data. And there's a couple rules we have in place to make sure that things look right. So if, for example, an athletic trainer accidentally puts in a concussion happening to the foot, the verification will, end, will catch it and let the athletic trainer know, you know, concussions don't happen to your feet. You need to go back and fix this. It won't uh, go through. Uh, other checks it'll do is, let's say, it's a sport like football, and uh, they're doing an injury in the end of January when football is not occurring. It'll catch that and flag it and say, you know, hey, what's up with this? Let's, let's take a look and let's have you change it. Um, at the same time, data quality control staff will come and intervene if needed. Um, these are hired staff hired by the data list center who will assist the ATs in correcting the data. So you have the verification engine, which is automated, but you also have in-house staff who are able to then work with the athletic trainers uh, and help them correct and rectify the issue as well. So after it goes through these checks, the data is ready for analysis. So I hope that uh, I've made a little bit more sense. Um, if uh, anyone does have additional questions, we can uh, discuss it at the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to move forward and talk about some of the sports we look at. So 25 sports, primarily 12 men's, 13 women's. We're actually starting to collect uh, men's volleyball. We are collecting, uh, we're entering our second season. However, we don't have sufficient information right now to present it. Uh, and we're actually looking into uh, equestrian sports and rodeo sports. Um, because I, there seems to be a little bit more interest, particularly in the Midwest. I think Colorado State actually has uh, a rodeo and equestrian program as well. Um, and I'm hoping that we're, we're going to be able to work with them a bit to kind of find the proper code book to make sure that we're looking at the injuries and the, the mechanisms of injury that are of interest to them. So as I mentioned here, the sports are you know men's and women's basketball, cross country, ice hockey, lacrosse, soccer, swimming and diving, tennis, in and outdoor track. Uh, we also have men's baseball, football, wrestling, women's field hockey, gymnastics, softball, volleyball. Uh, those acronyms are there for, for my own benefit versus uh, everyone else's, just so I make sure I uh, tell everyone. Um, by the numbers, we usually have about 100 universities annually uh, participating in the uh, NCAA Injury Surveillance Program. Uh, this is one thing where I want to I, I wanna do give a warning about because uh, there are over 1,100 member institutions in the NCAA. and we're only looking at a small segment. So we hope that there is generalizability in some of the uh, findings we present, but um, given the small uh, percentage, it's only about 10% of the schools actually participating, we do have some limitations with our data. And furthermore, not all 100 of these schools are actually participating in all those sports I mentioned. So if I remember correctly, Don, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, High School Rio, when it originally started, it was looking at uh, 100 schools from a random sample across the U.S. who are actually providing nine sports. So they had to provide all nine sports, and as uh, time moved on, they then started adding schools that had certain sports played, or they could provide data for certain sports. And we've gone with that approach with um, recruitment for the NCAA member institutions. It's really hard to get a school to participate and come on board when you want them to put all 25 sports or however many sports they participate in. Um, and sometimes it's easier to say, well, why don't you do, you know, basketball this year? Maybe next year you can do wrestling or you can switch off and do another sport. So we really appreciate any time we can get any data from any of these schools. Um, so one example here is women's tennis. You know, annually about 12 schools provide data, but you have 865 sponsoring schools. So we only get 1% of the actual member institutions that have uh, tennis uh, women's tennis in their uh, sports programming. At the same time, we have a, a thing such as men's hockey, where about 19 schools provide data, but there's a far, num far fewer number of sponsoring schools, and that leads to a higher participation rate. Um, and then we have schools where, you know, sports where we have a lot of teams participating, so 55 approximately annually participate with uh, providing data for men's basketball. Um, but a lot of schools in the NCAA participate in men's basketball, and we're only getting 5% of the, of the sample. So I really wanted to just lay that right out on the table as one of our limitations. We're always looking at ways to sort of increase participation, um, just trying to find ways to in incentivize it for the athletic trainers uh, and making sure that they get the data back as well so that they can use uh, the national uh, estimates that we provide to then help compare their own injury rates to that of the uh, sample we have here. 
So as, as mentioned, um, you know, I talked about us analyzing uh, the data and presenting it. Um, we have a lot of different ways that we present the data um, from the system. Uh, one of the big things is that we have to uh, present the data to the NCAA, the CSMAS, which is the competitive safeguards, um, and medical aspects of sports committee, which meets twice a year, and they really look at um, drug testing, sports rules, um, and just uh, betterment for the uh, safety of student athletes. Uh, a lot of sports also have rules committees, so ice hockey has their own specific rules committee, and they ask us to look at certain issues. So, for example, in men's ice hockey, uh, they require a full-length mask, and they're looking into a three-quarter length mask, mask, and they were asking us for information about uh, what do you think the, the increase in injuries could be if they uh, shortened the mask to be more like the NHL standards. Uh, football, for example, um, has been asking us a lot about the rule change for the kickoff. So how many here are football fans? Yeah, so good good old Pac-12. Yeah, Colorado's Pac-12, right? So, yeah, okay, yeah, they keep changing, so I lose track. I, I, I was a Husky, UW Husky as an undergrad, so I always have a soft spot part for the Pac-12 even. Yeah, it's Pac-12 now, or I don't know. Um, but um, there is a kickoff rule where they, they change the, the, the place of the kickoff in the 2012 uh, season, and so one of the things they want us to do after this year of uh, data collection is look at the three years before the rule change and the three years after to see if there is a change in the uh, proportion and the rates of severe injuries as well as concussions. Um, but these are some examples that I have listed up here of some of the rule changes that have happened um, thanks to the NCAA Injury Surveillance Program. So we're looking at, you know, wood-like standards for non-wood bats, eye protection, uh, you know, a lot of stuff in football, uh, concussion management plans, things of that nature. Uh, we also publish a lot. Uh, we actually work uh, with the committee uh, called the uh, Internal internal uh, review committee, which is a group of scholars from across the U.S. Don's actually a member of it. And um, what the committee does is they actually look at applications that are sent in by external reviewers, and they uh, more or less review manuscripts or study proposals to see if our data is able to uh, help answer their study question. And if they do, it goes through a process where they uh, sign a user license agreement, they get permission from the NCAA because the NCAA actually owns the data, although the data center houses it, and they're able to get a data set and then write a manuscript and uh, have it published. So we have about 10 papers up here that have been um, utilizing the uh, old data from 2004 to 2009. We're about to release the 2009-2014 data set as well, which will be quite cool because it does include that uh, non-time loss injury component as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of good different things here. Knee injury patterns, ACL injuries in football, um, toe turf injuries, uh, ACL injuries. I think you're kind of seeing a, a pattern here of what sport people will want information on or the research data on. So on that, on that note, I'm going to talk more about football. Uh, I want to show you all a couple of examples of some of the things we've been uh, doing with some of this data. So practice concussions in football um, is kind of a, a developing topic just because the focus really has been on these higher concussion rates that have occurred in competition versus practice. So on the, the right here, we have a table that looks at the concussion rates in college football uh, from the 2004 to 2013 academic year, so 10 years of data there. Um, and as you can see, and I'm, I'm, this is one of the first things I was put through my head as, an, as a rising epidemiology student was you had to learn how to present uh, rate ratio. So I wanted to include this as an emphasis to use to say, you know, see, this is what I learned. <laughs> the competition concussion rate in football was 7.4 times the practice concussion rate, and I even got the 95% confidence interval in there. But um, we estimate that despite that larger uh, concussion rate in competition versus practice, there are nationally 5,000 more concussions that are occurring in practice versus competition in collegiate football. And it's typically the other way around in all the other sports that are included in the NCAA, where the larger counts are occurring on the uh, competitions versus the practices. So this is a very interesting and unique uh, phenomenon that occurs uh, solely in college football uh, compared to the other sports. But then when you look at the actual exposures, um, the number of competition AEs in football was about 10% the size of that of practice AEs. And an athlete exposure is another term um, that we use in injury surveillance, which is pretty much saying one athlete's participation in one practice 
or one competition. So if you have a football team of 30 individuals participating in a practice, that's 30 athlete exposures. If you have 10 uh, people running in one cross-country race, that's 10 competition AEs for those cross-country athletes. So what this has really uh, made us at the data list was a little concerned about was we wanted to look at this greater amount of cumulative exposure time and um, really wanted to look at this opportunity to mitigate the risk. And certain divisions, such as the Ivy League and the, our very own Pac-12, implemented practice con contact restrictions to sort of decrease these head injuries. Um, and one of the big things that came of concern was amount the type of equipment that was worn or the type of practices that were occurring in activities. Uh, and they actually contacted us as they were going through talks uh, with looking at changing the contact rules about, well, what is, what is the data showing? What, what can you provide with the data? So um, good news and bad news. We do have data that was able to look at equipment uh, worn and the type of practice. However, we only looked at that information in the 2004, 2005 through the 2008, 2009 academic years. So we are a little concerned about the limited generalizability to concerns in 2014. A lot can happen in five to 10 years. There are differences in knowledge, differences in education, differences in detection. So that's one uh, limitation we really had to, to present and warn them about. So with this data, we were able to look at the distribution of the athlete exposures in NCAA football uh, in the preseason uh, by equipment worn, and also look at the concussions that uh, were associated with those uh, equipment worn. So the table on the left is, uh, or the figure on the left, is showing that uh, about 51% of the athlete exposures occurring in the preseason in college football were when the athletes were fully padded, so fully equipped versus their helmets only, versus their shells, which are their helmets and their, their pads. So uh, not fully equipped there. It's kind of a nice middle ground there, I guess you could say. Uh, and um, when you look at the concussions, most of them were occurring when the individuals were fully padded. So from those, we were able to create rates. And as you can see, there's a nice, uh, nice little uh, effect there where we see that the fully padded uh, concussion rates are higher than the helmets only and the shells ones. Um, and for me, this isn't really saying much. Um, it's just saying that, you know, concussions are going to happen more often, but we have more exposures, uh, perhaps more, uh, you know, harder impacts because they are fully padded. And so we started to ask ourselves, well, what if it's not about what's being done? What if it is about what it's being done versus what's being worn? Um, so we wanted to add in the type of practices, and um, we didn't have enough information just with the preseason, so we included the regular and postseason here in the mix. So this is where things are going to get a little uh, complicated, so I'm going to try to walk through this bit by bit. So these are regular practices. These are just your, your regular drills that happen. They happen the majority of the time. These are our concussion rates uh, for... The, stratified by the type of equipment worn. So again, we see that, that nice uh, trend here where we have larger concussion rates in the fully padded uh, individuals versus the uh, helmets only. This is where it gets really interesting. 10% uh, of the athlete exposures, uh, or 10% of the concussions were happening during scrimmages, and 3% of the athlete exposures were happening from scrimmages. But we have this dramatic change in the rates. And because there's a lack of statistical power, I mean, we have a very wide 95% confidence interval. But I, I just wanted to kind of present this to show that um, there seemed to be something going on where if you were having a scrimmage and you were wearing shells, there was a higher uh, a rate of concussion as opposed to being fully padded. And walkthroughs, um, you know, as expected, very low race, just given the, the, the nature of the type of practice that it is. There's not a lot of contact going on uh, in the first place. So, you know, what is this really telling us is that the fully padded practices are comprising the slight majority of all the practice sessions, uh, a majority of the concussion occurrences, and a high concussion rate. But um, this really decreased when less equipment was worn. Um, but at the same time, we really wanted to focus on these scrimmages because they did have the highest concussion rates overall, although they only accounted for 10% of the concussions and only 3% of the exposures. So what we wanted to really think about, well, what does this mean in the context of previous research? And there's been a lot of research uh, that utilized previous NCAA data from the 
uh, mid uh, 80s, uh, early 90s, that was looking at the spring f uh, football practice concussion rates, which are a lot higher than that of the fall practices. And these were allowing contacts, uh, scrimmages, and I guess you could say that the spring game that everyone is very excited about in the in the spring, uh, first sense of uh, where your team season is going to go, is actually considered a scrimmage as well because it's a live, uh, it's an actual game going on, but between your uh, your teammates versus your uh, competitors, I guess you could say. Um, so really, what what came out of this was in July 2014. Uh, the NCAA actually made recommendations for contact limits for football practice. So I have outlined here some of these examples, uh, four contact practices a week in the preseason, um, and they really focused on minimizing the number of scrimmages that were happening. They saw that the injury uh, data was was uh, strong enough for them to, to feel that they needed to uh, minimize the number of scrimmages that were occurring because that's where the, the, the highest rates of concussions were happening. Um, and I think the, the important thing to think about as well is that these practices are controlled environments. I mean, it's not like a game where, you know, sometimes you have rules that try to minimize things, but sometimes anything can happen. Uh, but coaching staff can direct and correct athlete behavior as they practice their skills. And I think it's this great, powerful place where you can have concussion prevention interventions. Um, and I think um, one of the great things of these injury surveillance programs is we're able to look at concussions or any other injuries specifically occurring in practices are in competitions, and they're two very different worlds, I think, particularly in the sport of football. So um, other football-related research we were doing is uh, a little bit more recent is this uh, concern about cut blocking in football as well as uh, pace of play. And um, I I'll admit um, I'm going to step on my high horse here a bit. One of the, the best work days, um, not, as, not as great as Dawn where she got to meet Obama, but I got to meet someone just a little slightly lower than Barack Obama, and that was uh, got to go on a phone call with Nick Saban, the head coach of Alabama, to talk about pace of play. And if you're a college football fan like me, you'll know Nick Saban's uh, seen as one of the most well-respected, or maybe if you're a, a fan from the other side, most hated uh, football coaches. Um, but um, I thought it was a, a very excellent opportunity to talk with him about some of the research we were doing, given this concern about the substitution rule and the pace of play rule. Um, and I, I just thought it was a, an awesome opportunity to actually see coaches really care about the health and well-being of their athletes. Because I think sometimes there are a lot of uh, stereotypes that come into existence about um, the people who are, are coaching the, uh, the athletes. And this is a, a great reminder for me as a fan and as a researcher to remember that the coaches are one of the first points of intervention, and they really do have the power to uh, make some dramatic and, uh, changes in the safety and well-being of their athletes. Um, targeting rule is another one that's of concern, uh, as well as the kickoff rule changes. Um, but, you know, really what I've been saying here for the last 15 minutes is just everything about football. And there's more to the ISP than just football. So um, these last few s sections, I want to talk about some of the other great work we're, we're looking at within some of these other sports. Um, so uh, when I used to watch the Winter Olympics and the Summer Olympics as a kid, I had my two favorite sports. Um, and for Winter Olympics, I don't know why, but I just got mesmerized with figure skating. You can ask me anything about figure skating, and I will give you an answer. You ask me who won this or that event, I, I know the history. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a sport uh, in the NCAA, so I can't talk to you about figure skating. My summer Olympic sport, though, my favorite one before track and field, before swimming, was gymnastics. And I ate that stuff up, and I was the one in front of the screen watching it all the time. Um, and it, it was kind of fun for me. The first project I wanted to work on when I was there at uh, the Dela Center working with the injury data was I wanted to look at women's gymnastics. It was this great opportunity to really kind of look at the data and, and look at something that I, I followed for so long, even though I can't do a handstand. I mean, I can't even touch my toes without bending my knees. So I'm the last person <laughs> to deal with flexibility. Um, but one of the cool things we got to do is we got to look at, you know, the rates across time. I mean, the uh, NCAA injury surveillance program has been around since the late 80s. And uh, Steve Marshall did a great paper in the Journal of Athletic Training in 2007 that looked at this, uh, this time period when they used uh, paper and pencil-based collections. And in 2004, they switched to this computerized version. And then uh, in 2009, we have the dataless version. So we can look at these trends and these injuries across 20 years. 
Um, I will know that there are different methodologies that are used in place, um, but I think it's just this cool tool that we can just look at so much data over such a long amount of time. Um, and we can also look at the uh, common injuries, not just by uh, practices or competitions, but also by event. Um, so we're able to see that you know, concussions occur the most uh, in the uneven bars, um, and so do shoulder strains. And then if we look at the balance beam, it's a lot of ankle sprains and foot sprains. Uh, if you have the vault, again, it's ankle sprains. And then the floor exercise, uh, you know, that's where the knee internal derangement is happening, you know, contact with the floor. So we think it has something to do with the landing mechanisms when they're uh, doing their complex twists and turns and saltos and tumbles and, th and things of that nature. Um, and it was, it was a fun experience for me to, to work with this data just because um, a lot of it went into the idea of well, what, what are causing these things and what are, the, what are these athletes um, exposing um, what sort of injuries are they at risk for. I mean, you know, I was there in 1996 watching Carrie's drug, you know, uh, fall on the first falls and see her miraculously uh, land and win the gold for the U.S. And I remember back then I was thinking just how amazing that is. Now when I look at data like this, I'm just wondering, was, was, was she crazy or was she, you know, what, what's going on there? Um, but then, you know, there's other sports we can also look at. Soccer, um, one of the, the, the great projects I'm working on that I, for me is a, a great personal adventure is um, I'm able to kind of tie in all these worlds of injury surveillance that I worked with. So um, we're working on this special issue with the Journal of Athletic Training to look at uh, competition and practice injuries uh, occurring in a couple different sports using a decade of high school Rio data with a decade of the uh, computerized uh, NCAA injury surveillance program data. And this graph here is just looking at these uh, rates across time in both systems. And I think the interesting thing is that um, it's pretty uh, much been decreasing in the NCAA level, but um, this disparity between the high school and the uh, the National uh, Collegiate uh, Athletic Association rates uh, and the competition level are slowly coming together, and it'll be uh, interesting to see what happens over time to see if this trend continues. Again, this could be a, a methodological entrance, uh, difference as well, so I think it just requires a little bit more exploration. Um, an another thing that we were really interested in in, in soccer, and the, the Rules Committee for Soccer was really interested in, is this idea of heading, uh, heading the ball. There's been a lot of research out there that uh, has looked at the components of uh, concussion sustained while heading the ball. And we really wanted to use our data as an opportunity to dive into this issue as well. So when we were doing some analyses, we found that about a third of uh, NCAA soccer injuries, be it in the men's side or the women's side, uh, are having concussions while uh, heading in, in soccer. And we thought about stopping there thinking, well, you know, this, it's heading the ball. That's, the, that's when the injuries are occurring. Um, but we wanted to add one more mix, and this is where things got really interesting. So we took those thirds of the pie, and we further stratified them by what percentage of those were from contact with the ball while exactly, while specifically heading the ball. So concussions sustained from the contact with the ball. Um, and we found that disparity coming into place where uh, it was a larger percentage in the women's soccer were heading the ball was uh, sp directly uh, impacting, uh, causing the concussions, I guess you could say, versus contact from players, contact from the posts. So um, this is something that's been of interest and is requiring us to do a couple more follow-up studies over the next few years to really look more into this uh, issue. Cross-country is uh, a sport that is um, slowly getting a little bit more uh, examinations in uh, the sports level. I know uh, uh, Lauren's working on a cross-country paper right now and uh, on the high school real level, and we're actually working on one from the Daedalus level as well uh, for the NCAA. Um, and I just kind of wanted to show a quick summary of what we're finding. I mean, as expected, the lower extremity injuries are where um, a lot of the uh, injuries are occurring. But what we found really interesting was that a lot of these would have not been tracked had we not gone with this uh, non-time loss inclusion. So one example I'm going to show here is so you have ankle sprain here in men's cross country. So this table is telling us that 11% of all injuries occurring in men's cross country are ankle sprains. But of those 11%, 46% would have been returned to play before 24 hours. 
So we would have never gotten those injuries had we not used this uh, non-time loss inclusion as well. And as you can see, we have foot inflammation. All 5% of those wouldn't have been included, a great majority of a lot of these injuries. And I think the non-time loss injury component really comes into play when we're looking at a lot of these sports that include a lot of overuse injuries, such as cross-country, the, the swimming and diving, the indoor tracks, the outdoor tracks, uh, the tennis. Is, uh, and we're trying to get more information on golf as well. Um, so this is really exciting stuff for us that we can start seeing um, th this, these type of injuries. The last thing I want to present, since we, uh, we do have time, uh, I was worried I wouldn't get through the slide. Um, one of the, I think, the most interesting things that we've been able to do at Daedalus is compare across the lifespan. And I know this is something Don and I used to talk about when I was a, a grad student back at The Ohio State University, and even when I continued through at UNC Chapel Hill, was this idea of how can we look at uh, the risk of injury across the lifespan. And it's going to be a while before we have these longitudinal studies that track a child from the early ages when they're first starting to specialize in the sport all the way to the time that they hopefully become a professional player. But at this time, uh, the most we can do is look at these cross bands. So Data Center actually houses three different programs uh, for injury surveillance. So we have the NCAA Injury Surveillance Program. We have a program similar to Don's High School Reel called Nation. And um, we also have youth football. So we have uh, a couple of teams, not a couple, we actually have quite a number of teams from across uh, many different communities, across four states, across the U.S. Um, and they provide us information about injuries that occur during youth football from ages 5 to 14. Um, so as you can see, we have different, uh, you know, seasons and athlete seasons and exposures there. But I think the interesting graph here is here. Um, our youth football is really this component of 5 to 14, and we try to stratify it by age. Um, and there are 5- and 6-year-olds and 7-year-olds playing uh, youth football. Uh, some may be playing the flag level. Some may be playing uh, the contact uh, sports. Um, but we didn't really have enough data from the 5- to 6-year-olds. But I think there's this interesting, nice trend as we see these rates going up as you move into the, uh, the older ages. Uh, concussion rates by event type and level. Um, Pretty similar, and at first we thought this said that you know maybe uh, youth football players aren't at a, a higher risk for injury for concussions than individuals at the high school level or the collegiate level. But as we started exploring some of these other injuries that were occurring, things got a little interesting. Um, ankle sprains uh, were much lower at the youth level compared to the high school or the collegiate football levels. Knee sprains were much lower at the youth level compared to the other two playing levels. Fractures were even uh, lower than those two. So we got to wondering, well, why is the concussion rate not lower in the youth level than it is in the, uh, the high school and the collegiate levels like we're seeing with these fractures and these sprains and other injuries? Um, so this is something we're really trying to dive into now uh, as we uh, prepare these manuscripts for publication. Uh, so this is a busy slide, so I'm going to try to explain what this is. So these are common con con concussion symptoms um, by the plane level. So um, the green graph is for the percentage of individuals at the collegiate level who reported the symptom. Uh, the red is for high school, and the blue is for youth. Uh, we actually use the uh, SCAT-3 for all three of these, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the SCAT-3, but it'd be kind of hard to tell, to ask a five-year-old what tinnitus is or what uh, nausea is. So th that is one of the limitations, but we wanted to have this opportunity to, to kind of have a apples-to-apples -apples comparison of uh, different um, plane levels to kind of get an idea of where concussion symptomology was occurring. And I think the, the remarkable finding here, given the limitations, is that they're, they're pretty similar overall. And then if we look at time to resolution of symptoms, um, again, uh, very similar curves here. Uh, and I think, um, yeah, it's just a, a remarkable finding we had here that these, these symptomology curves are very similar, particularly in the youth and the, uh, the, the, the college level. The high school level is a little lower, a bit more, and we have a little bit more exploration to do with that as well. Um, so, as I mentioned before, um, you know, it's, it's hard to try to get a five-year-old to understand what a concussion is and what are the symptoms they're experiencing. So, Joe Murphy, uh, one of our colleagues from Charleston Southern University, actually did a qualitative study with some of the athletic trainers who were providing uh, the injury data. 
at the youth football level. Um, and they admitted they had difficulties evaluating children with concussions due to this lack of understanding with the evaluation process and the symptom checklist. Um, so one of our plans is to actually use the uh, recently uh, released uh, child version of the SCAT, the uh, uh, concussion symptom checklist, to uh, kind of get an idea of if that will change some of our findings. So, I mean, uh, sports injury surveillance is this great vital tool for evidence-based uh, decision-making, although I, I've been the first person to say that we have to really show uh, and acknowledge our, our limitations as well as trying to find ways to continuously minimize them. Um, it's changed a lot in the past half century. Um, it's been, you know, I've only been doing this work for a number of years now, but there's just so much that has been done before my time, and um, it's just been an incredible and fascinating journey to really learn about what has been done. And we also, you know, the, the big thing I learned and I think about every day is how do our roles as researchers have to change and how do we provide these findings back to our populations and, and also how much. Um, I was at an interesting conference out in Indianapolis at St. Vincent uh, Hospital and there was a big discussion about the ethics of actually providing uh, research findings back. And this was done with a lot of, in the context of a lot of uh, infectious diseases or sexually transmitted diseases and the, eth uh, the ethical issues of reporting those back to your, your patients. Um, they're involved in a research study. And I got to thinking, well, you know, does this apply to our field uh, in, in sports injury as well? And uh, as mentioned, I th really think we need to start looking at future surveillance, focusing on lifespan studies, uh, both cross-sectional uh, uh, cross sectional examinations as well as these longitudinal samples. And I think there's really, uh, we're at this great point where a lot of people are, are in the same mindset as well. And there's a lot of discussion about looking at what's going to happen for an individual who starts at an early age all the way to their high school, their collegiate, their perhaps professional playing career. And I think we're going to start seeing studies as those uh, come into existence here. Um, small samples, perhaps, um, but I think it'll be a great start. Um, you know, one of the ways we've really been looking at, uh, you know, trying to present our findings is through fact sheets. Um, we uh, provide fact sheets. They're all available on our website, thedalacenter.org. Um, um, and we've been trying to have a bigger presence on Twitter and Facebook as well. Um, a lot of us were very much anti-Twitter, but we've kind of learned we had to get with the times. Um, so I've been learning how to tweet, which has been a fun experience. But um, I wanted to give a special thanks to all of our participating athletic trainers. They do so much for us. Um, th there's just words that can't express how much they provide. Um, and they help us uh, learn as researchers what's uh, feasible and what's uh, beneficial for them and how we can provide information back for them in a meaningful way as well. Uh, Steve was one of the first people who uh, also helped uh, start up the, uh, the, the computerized version of the injury surveillance program. And uh, I have to give special thanks to him because you know, he is my advisor at UNC. And I um, also have to thank our Dale Center staff. Um, who are listed here, um, and check out our Twitter site. Um, and thank you so much for your time, and uh, thank you for having me in Denver. Uh, I've been having a great time here. Thank you, everyone. Uh -oh. so we definitely have time for questions. Hi, Carol. Um, nice job. Thank um, you. I'm curious to know, you know, can you look in your data at differences between uh, digital one? Yeah, um, with divisions, we do have divisions, uh, stratifications possible. In certain sports, such as football and basketball, it's easy to have those delineations and those, uh, uh, those stratified results available. With sports such as uh, the gymnastics paper I'm working on, we only have one Division II school. We have a couple of Division III schools, so it's really hard to make uh, an idea of what the Division II uh, gymnastics injury rate is only using one program. So there are those limitations there, uh, and those schools with the, the smaller sample sizes, we're trying to, always trying to find ways to increase. As far as uh, win-loss records, um, we would be able to, if we wanted to, go back and find that data. Um, yeah, we would need a, a, a large amount of staff. Um, 
We're actually thinking about a project that's looking at temperature and altitude, uh, given the findings that were uh, recently released related to the NFL um, that uh, made the suggestion that altitude may be a protective factor, a higher altitude may be a protective factor for concussions, uh, at least in the NFL players. And uh, there's been some discussion with some folks at some uh, universities out east about doing a sort of study with some of our data, and that would require their staff to uh, go back and look at those games yeah, retrospectively. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's purely a function of voluntary uh, nature. Uh, I know when Steve, I, I, you know, Don talks a lot about how the high school reel was developed um, as a sort of replication, or uh, replication is maybe not perhaps the right word, um, of the NCAA injury surveillance program. But there's a lot of things we've learned from Don's work with the high school Rio system that we've tried to apply. And one of the things we tried to apply early on was having this random subset based on division and based on location. And it just didn't work well. The ATs weren't going for it. Um, and we struggled, and we kind of had to scrap plans and go back to um, – looking at uh, a convenient sample, voluntary sample of ATs. Uh, and we try to give them, um, you know, incentives to participate. Um, we have an iPad raffle for each um, for each uh, surveillance system that we have, the youth football, the uh, nation high school data, and the NCAA injury surveillance data. Um, we were able to work with the NATA so that they can actually get uh, continuing integration uh, units to participate. Um, so we're, we're just trying to find ways always to increase participation. Um, real quick, just let me jump in real quick and, and lots of questions just in case people want to start leaving. Since we have so many students here, can you really quickly just run through all of you as students, faculty, staff, whatever, can access the system for research? So yeah. students that want to do a practicum or a capstone project, can you tell them just real quick how to access the data? Yeah, if you go to our website, there's a, a resources page called uh, the DISC. Um, and that is where you can receive an application to apply to user data. Um, the data will be reviewed by an internal review committee of uh, scholars across the U.S. who will um, discuss and get a sense of if our data is able to answer your research questions. Um, if it gets approval, it goes to the NCAA for approval. You sign a user license agreement, and then we cut you a data set that you can then use. Um, and we have a methods paper out in the Journal of Athletic Training that you can use to um, uh, to to help write the methods section out, um, we're always available staff to help. Um, I'm always more than willing to share my code to help make your lives easier as well. So um, free data, easy application process, and guidelines on how yeah. to use it. Yeah. Perfect for a capstone practice. Definitely. I saw a question. Yeah. I think it's really. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering. I'm wondering about the completeness. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the benefits of that of the verification engine and the data quality control staff is that those will get uh, rung up as you know you know, red light, I guess you could say. It's a red light issue, and uh, the AT are able to be notified by our data quality control staff about, hey, you're missing this information, or, um, you know, this isn't complete, or, you know, as mentioned, you can't have a concussion on the foot. Um, so there's a lot of checks to make sure that missing data is very much kept to a minimal. Yeah. But is it more of a spell? Do you have to spell it to the university and sell it to the higher powers there that say, yes, we'll provide time for our AP to squeeze this in? Yeah. <laughs> the biggest challenges we have are, are, are helping the ATs. You know, the, the idea of double data entry, I mean, seems horrible in, in my, you know, in my naive look at uh, data collection. 
efforts. Um, so the, the, the common data elements and working off the pre-existing electronic medical records is a way to sort of let them just continue doing their job and click a button, boom, it gets sent. Um, I think a lot of it is just we have to do a better job of presenting it as that and saying there's no double data entry and really buy in. Uh, get buy-in from the ATs to say that, look, we're, we're going to give you this data, and then you can come back and you can compare your school rates to the uh, rates across the U.S., and you can have an idea if you're doing a better job or if you're doing a, a job that needs to have a, a different perspective or a different change. Um, sometimes we we get help from the uh, rules committees. Um, when the Ice Hockey Rules Committee was very interested in the uh, – data collection efforts to look at the effect of a three-quarter length mask versus a full length mask. Uh, they were actually gracious enough to contact the athletic directors of all their men's ice hockey programs and said, get involved in this. And at one point, we had a 50% uh, participation rate uh, in one year. Um, so that was awesome for us to get all that information. Um, and we've been trying very much hard to you know, continue looking at um, ways to increase that participation. So it, it's, it's working from many different levels, from the AT all the way up to the university athletic director. Yeah, um, you know, it's it usually happens that we have, you know, people who have been working with us for the whole time since the paper and pen uh, version. Um, but uh, one of the things that happens is that uh, a school may decide to change the vendor. So many different vendors exist, and right now we only work with two of them. Uh, there's one vendor out there that has a 30% share of the market in the NCAA, and we're trying very hard to get them on board, and they're slowly working on those coding applications to make sure that they have the same common data elements as us. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's one school we worked with for a number of years, and they switched to another vendor, and they can no longer provide data. And we said, well, you know, you could use our IST and double data enter, um, but, you know, I, I won't blame them if they say no. <laughs> And some, you know, some head athletic trainers and some ADs will tell their staff, like, I don't care, double data enter, it's your duty, this is important. But we don't try to, you know, coerce anyone negative in a negative manner to do that. So one of the reasons why I wanted to invite Zach here and, and talk about this today, uh, particularly with so many students, is I think this is such a neat um, example of public health going from surveillance to analysis to translation to the population. Uh, you know, the NCAA rules committees make rules that every single college player has to play by. Uh, the high school groups that I work with make rules based on every, that every single high school athlete has to play by. But yet you heard that for students that are interested in careers in public health, this is a really, really young field, yeah. sports engineering challenge. Right? This is the gold standard system that has been around for over two decades. Mine's been around for a decade now. And we are literally up front that we have tons of locations. Small samples, yeah. uh, incomplete data, convenience samples. Yeah. So if any of you are looking for a, an area of public health where you can really make a mark and really move the field forward really quickly, come talk to us about sports. I think, yeah, this is a very exciting time to be, to be in the field. Um, injury epidemiology is such a young field, but then within injury ep epidemiology, you have sports injury epidemiology, and there's a lot of movement for growth. I think, you know, as students, you, you can still make big strides in the, in the field and um, be very proud of your work. Thank you so much for that. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs>